How's it going, everybody? Andrew Zarian here, Wrestling Observer Live. We're here every day, Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. on Saturdays with Jim Valley, and Sundays, 6 p.m. Eastern, with me. I'm here. We got nothing to talk about today, guys. Nothing is happening in the world of professional wrestling. I got up this t- this morning. I'm like, what are we going to talk about? What's been going on? Nothing. It's not like Vince McMahon is forcefully returning back to the WWE and putting himself as head of the board. It's not like we had Wrestle Kingdom happen. No, none of that. It's not like there's rumors that WWE may be sold. This is a nutty start to the year. I thought this was going to be a show all about Wrestle Kingdom, and I was going to pretty much, I was going to have John Alba on today. He is on, by the way. John Alba's joining me today to talk about just, you know, 2023 and professional wrestling and where he sees it going and all the cool stuff that we're looking forward to happening. Uh, WWE life after Vince almost, right? We got. I had to redo this whole entire show when this news broke. <laughs> Came out <laughs> late this week that Vince McMahon is returning back to WWE. WWE put out a press release. We're going to talk about that after our break. And all the, I guess, the, the fallout from this. What does this mean? What does this mean for the company possibly being sold? What does this mean for TV rights? What does this mean for the current structure of the company? Uh, this is a wild, wild story. I mean, I don't think if there was a if there was a Netflix movie that came out, I don't think they could do a better job than this. When we come back, John Alba joining me to break all of this down with you guys. Wrestling Observer Live Sunday edition on Sports Byline. We'll be back right after this. Wrestling Observer Live Sunday edition here. Andrew Zarin. I'm joined by a good friend of mine, John Alba. What's going on, John? What's up, man? This is very exciting. You're not seeing double out there. This is real and living color, hair to hair, mano a mano. It's great to see you, buddy. Happy New you know, Year to you. Happy New Year to you. There, I always say there's three people in the podcasting, in the pro wrestling podcasting business that have the top three hair. Uh, actually, let's say four. Uh, Chris Van Vliet, for sure. Uh, John Alba, myself, and Eric Bischoff. Three three oh, yeah. guys with great hair in pro- professional wrestling. But this is fake. This thing just detaches. I glue this thing on. You got to see me. I'm walking through Penn Station, going to work. That, that If it's raining, the glue's coming off. It's terrible. It's a, it's a disaster. A lot to talk about. Talk about hair. <laughs> a lot to talk about today here on the show. John, where can people find you before? I want to give a big plug to you. You do a whole bunch of stuff. You pick what, where, where you want people to uh, discover you. Obviously, Appreciate on Twitter, that, John yeah. Alba. But... You do a show with Matt Hardy. You do a show with Eric Bischoff. Uh, give people a little uh, little insight on what you do. Yeah, you can check out the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy, which I, I truthfully believe Matt is one of the most insightful pro wrestling minds in the industry and an outstanding storyteller. Uh, if you haven't checked that podcast out, yesterday we just celebrated our one-year anniversary of it, and we're very proud of that. Uh, I host Strictly Business with Eric Bischoff, which has been pretty busy in the last couple of weeks, as you would imagine. That drops every Thursday, wherever you get your podcasts. I've been doing some work with Fight recently and hosting some shows and some interviews for them. And I got a wrestling-oriented Patreon as well, wrestling according to Alba.com. Very cool stuff. Uh, I want to I want to touch on some of the other stuff that you're doing at the end of the show. Also, let's start with the big story here. Vince McMahon returns to WWE as executive chairman of the board. Here is the timeline. This all began on Thursday. The Wall Street Journal put out an article reporting that Vince McMahon had requested to return to the company. After the article was published, Vince released his own statement that he's coming back to help facilitate a TV rights deal and or sale of the company. Additionally, he's bringing back the former co-presidents, George Barrios and Michelle Wilson, to the board of directors. He's stacking the board here. This is, I mean, we'll go into why here. It was also re- revealed that Vince had sent an essential a, a initial letter i believe on december 27th with the intent of coming back WWE, wwe's response was not uh i guess what he expected or wanted uh they said that they were willing to work with him on a review process for a sale or or a rights deal but really didn't want him back in a in a top position In the last letter back to the board from Vince, he said that he would not approve any rights deals or sale unless he was involved from the outset, from the onset. 
of the uh, this the the negotiation. Note, Vince also has eighty one percent voting power here. Eighty one percent of the Class B stock. So let's go through Thursday. You were posting a lot about this on Twitter. I saw the Wall Street Journal story happen at the time. I, you know, and and you make phone calls and you ask people and you kind of hear, you know, everybody starts scrambling at that point. So it, it kind of even, and I don't, I'll tell you, you know, John, I think John is more of a journalist than I am. I'm not really a journalist. John actually does his due diligence. I have, you know, my my sources and I've been pretty clear. I have a lot of friends in media and and I'm told things. John actually goes out there and starts digging, much like Sean Ross Sapp, another great journalist, and Dave Meltzer, too. I start asking people, I don't know what's true at this point, because everybody has their own opinion on this, because it is a very hot topic. What was your initi- initial thought on Thursday when this story came out? Well, I think you have to go back even a little further than that, Andrew, because I want to say it was about three and a half weeks ago or so, we saw that last Wall Street Journal report that mentioned that Vince was potentially going to position himself for a return to the company. And I shot out some messages when that report dropped, including to someone who's pretty high up in the company. And and I said to them, what what do you think are the chances that something like this could actually happen? And they go, four out of 10. Wow. And I'm like, 40% chance is still higher than I would have thought, but that's not like super high. Thursday rolls around, I get a DM that says, 8 out of 10. And then on <laughs> Friday morning, I get a DM that says, 10 out of 10. Yeah, well, I, I'll i go even, even further back. Uh, I had dinner with somebody uh, <laughs> from there, and it was like, happy days are here. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, I was told the odds of him coming back in that position are very low people that you would imagine that would want him back really are thriving right now and don't want him back. Uh, things are good. uh, It's a, it's a well-oiled machine and it would only disrupt things. Yeah. Now that that was two weeks or or maybe three weeks prior to all this happening. Mm -hmm. I, I think it was December 20th was the first letter that was sent from Vince to the board. And then it was a week later that the board responded on December 27th. And in that letter, they could not have been more clear that they felt it was not in the best interest for him to return. And that, and not only did they make that clear, they said unanimously. The word unanimous was used in the letter sent back to Vince that unanimously, which includes, of course, his daughter, his son-in-law and Nick Khan. They felt that it was not in the best interest he returned. And that letter back mentioned non-public information that the board was aware of. Now, you could look at that from, wow, they have information, or it could have just been a leveraging tool to try to convince him not to come back. And then it was a few days later, New Year's Eve, I believe, he shot back the next response where, yes, as you said, he basically said, I'm going to hold this company hostage (laughs) and I'm not going to sign off on anything without being the executive chair. Yeah, I mean, the, the, these letters from both sides were so well crafted. Uh, obviously, every every word matters. Uh, with Vin, in Vince's letter, when he said he doesn't intend unchanging management, intend is the key word. He didn't yes. say he's not going to. WWE's response back was that they're they're happy to hear that there's no intention on changing the management. So again, intention is is in there. Friday comes, WWE formally files with the SEC that Vince is officially back. George Barrios and Michelle Wilson were added to the board of directors, replacing Joellen Dillon, Jeffrey Speed, and Alan Wexler. They were removed, so Vince, Michelle Wilson, and George Barrios come in. At 10 a.m. Eastern, WWE issued a press release in that they welcome Vince McMahon's return and looking forward to exploring all strategic alternatives to maximize shareholder value if there was any kind of corporate double talk that you want to show as an example in some sort of study this is the best example of that exploring all strategic alternatives to maximize shareholder value there were also two resignations on the board too on friday morning yes which i I think needs to be said because it paints a picture of the chaos that was going on and, and it, it is chaos, regardless of how you want to paint it. This is a massive maneuver. Now, in theory, if Vince McMahon is strictly there just to 
help facilitate a rights negotiation or a potential sale, it largely shouldn't have much consequence on the product in and of itself. But as all of us who have followed Vince McMahon's career very closely, we know that the likelihood of that uh, remains to be seen in that the responsibilities will be restricted to just that. Yeah, I believe one of them was uh, Manjeet Singh, and he is an executive at Sony. I can't remember offhand who the second person was. But he is a positive here. The stock market exploded at this news. At one point, going above 20%. It was up 17% upon hearing about a possible sale. Around 3.30 in the afternoon, through between 3 and 3.30, there was an all-hands-on-deck Zoom meeting with employees. Talent was not in this meeting. Employees were told... There will, be, there will also not be any changes to the management team or their responsibilities, including the roles held by Triple H, Stephanie McMahon, or Nick Khan. So this is very interesting stuff here. Uh, chaos, of, of course. Uh, you know, I've been in the corporate world for about 20 years now in some capacity, on and off. I sometimes lose my mind and I quit and I take a 24-month sabbatical and then I go to another place sometimes. Uh, this stuff happens all the time. However, not so public. Not as public as this. When we get back, we're going to go more into this story because why not? It's a humongous story here and it's going to change the entire path of this company for the, for the future. Wrestling Observer Live Sunday edition here on Sports Byline. We'll be back right after this. Wrestling Observer Live Sunday edition here. Andrew Zarin joined by John Alba. Little ACDC, Vince's favorite band, apparently. Uh, it's the re- ACDC is the reason I play music. Is that really? Vince, it is. I, not Bon Jovi. Not uh, not a Bon Jovi guy. ACDC and Springsteen are my okay. two. Uh, that's my everything. And it always pops me just how much of a mark for ACDC Vince is. And <laughs> every, work, every workout video you see of Vince, ACDC is blasting in the background at 4 a.m. That's hysterical. You know, that, is, and also, this is the difference between John and I. One of the few, I discovered that he's a big fan of sous vide and so am I. Oh, yes. Uh, we're going we're gonna to do a show about sous vide apparently. This is going <laughs> to happen. But uh, he loved, you know, he's a Jersey guy. Springsteen, for sure. Me, Billy Joel. I'm a That's Northeastern fine. Queens guy. Billy Joel, you know. They, they're they're to, fans of each other. They're pals. They are. They are. Let's get to Saturday here. This is where uh, I had... Uh, just phone call after phone call in the morning because this went on the financial side and I and my, my spidey senses tingle when you talk about the financial end of stuff. So it came out on Saturday. There was a tweet that was put out by Alex Sherman. Uh, Alex is with CNBC. He's a media reporter over there. And the article was the long anticipated WWE sale process is, is upon us. He was told that J.P. Morgan has been hired to help lead the sales talks, and he put a list of potential buyers. We'll go into this because eh, I'm a little iffy on that list of potential buyers here, but I put out a tweet. You know, I I have friends at JPMC. Obviously, they're not going to tell me anything that is uh, not for public disclosure or anything like that. I want to get that out of the way here, but a couple public things out there is that You know, my tweet was, I don't think Vince McMahon can use Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley as they probably still hold his margin loans. It's a conflict of interest. So JPMC is the logical choice as the only there's only a few banks that could handle this solo. I also said I wouldn't be shocked if there was a sovereign wealth fund uh, to buy all the shares and go private. And a lot of people wanted me to explain what that means. It means Saudi or money from Qatar. Saudi has been... uh, I mean, just buying up everything. They recently got 5% share of Nintendo. They launched their Live Golf uh, brand, which was very controversial. But there's a number of reasons also why they're going to do this. So here, just um, this is just my thoughts here, right? If JPMC is leading this, uh, whatever this sale would be, the only other two banks that could possibly handle the other side of the acquisition is Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. So at that point, it would not be a conflict of interest because they would probably figure out, okay, it's a third party that's doing it, or maybe Goldman Sachs would do it. I it, Very interesting stuff here because we only have a couple of big banks that can handle a sale like this. It would most likely be, as of, I guess, Friday's closure, as, as of 4 p.m. on Friday, the stock evaluation, the, the company value is around $6.2 billion. I've heard that they, you know, it could be upwards of $109 per share 
boosting this even higher. So let's say the sale number is anywhere from $6.2 billion to $10 billion. Who has that kind of cash on hand that they would like to spend on WWE? So, John, who who would not? Let's talk about that first. Warner Brothers Discovery. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't I don't see that happening. I know that Warner Brothers yeah. Discovery is on this list that was put out there. Uh, I, I cannot with their own internal issues and and cost cutting. Uh, this is a company where the CEO or president I can't remember uh, stated that they may not need the NBA, depending on. Slow. Yeah, yes. uh, you know, if you're looking to slash your costs or and or or you know, essentially uh, nickel and dime the NBA on your next rights deal, you're not really in the market to spend ten billion dollars on a property you don't even know what you're going to be able to do with when you have a wrestling property already. So I don't see that happen. That costs them a, a fraction of this. <laughs> You know, what, what yeah, are we talking about? I yeah, not see, a chance. I don't see any way in which Warner Brothers Discovery would be in on it. You know, as far as the, the Saudi stuff goes, one element of that that is interesting, and you mentioned the Live Golf stuff. Live Golf has struggled to find a TV rights partner here in the United States because of the extracurricular stuff attached to them. And if if that were to purchase wwe and keep the current management team in place i'd be curious to see what the response would be from potential media rights suitors and the only advantage that i think wwe would have on that front is that nick khan who is extremely well connected in that world would be the one wheeling and dealing on that and that's something that live golf does not have in its corner but uh, man if the saudis were to sweep in here and purchases i feel like it would just kind of flip the entire uh hierarchy of how we know this entire industry and it would change it forever i i really do think at the end of the day comcast is probably the number one suitor in the discussion here just because of the cash available and the flexibility to distribute wwe programming in whatever way it would want to and the established relationships that already exist there andrew yeah, uh, I think for the Comcast, I believe they have about $168 billion on hand. This is a mega, mega company with a lot of money, and they're in bed with them already. You know, you look at how much they're paying them currently. I, I believe it's $240 million a year for Raw, another $200 million a year for the network. You're already at $440 million. They acquire plus, if NXT. They, plus NXT, which whatever that deal is. So let's say $500 million off the bat a year you're paying. I'm, I'm guessing. I'm rounding up. I'm rounding up a, a little too much maybe. But you also bring in SmackDown in the mix, plus whatever else. You're looking at a lot of money per year. You know, you could recoup that cost in a decade or less than that, and you're fine. You know, five, six years, you recoup that cost, and now the property's yours and everything else is in the bank. You don't have a TV rights deal that's costing you a billion dollars. And there's also opportunities, too, if you were to get it in the Comcast family. Universal Studios is a property that could utilize WWE in a very efficient way as well. Uh, whether it's a content, whether it's with theme parks, there's other types of branding that WWE would fit in intellectual property-wise, which is why I, I really do believe that would be a pretty desirable buyer for WWE. But there's also companies like Endeavor, which maybe if there were to be a sale there... Maybe the company goes private. And Andrew, the biggest thing for me, and I'm curious your thoughts, should a buy happen, could you see one of the parameters of a deal being that Vince McMahon and the management team remain in charge here? I, w I, would, I would expect that to be the case. I agree. Yeah, I, I don't, I cannot, you know, here, here's, the qu here's a question I'm going to put out there. And, and, and this is an honest question that I have. And I, most likely I won't get this answer if I ask anybody at WWE. Why? Would they want to sell? Where, where where is the benefit? Is it is it a company growth possibility that they can't do on their own? You know, they're one of the few last me independent media companies out there. They're really uh, name me a name me another media company, and I'm not talking about live obviously sports. I'm not talking about the NFL, NBA. A media company that's independent on their own that that produces the content they produce that generates the the revenue that they generate. It doesn't really exist anymore. Well, and I think that's why a lot of people suspect 
that this move from Vince was strictly in the name of a sale so that he could finagle his way back in. And the press release Friday even stated that just because this is the intent, it doesn't guarantee that a sale would happen. Yeah, that that also is is part of it, that they're not really maybe maybe it's a negotiation bluff, you know, for a better deal. That also could be I mean, it. at the end of the day, we know for a fact the media rights deals are coming up here. So that is a significant yeah. asset of the conversation that is in play. Yeah, but you know what's interesting? Neither you or myself or most other people that are talking about this and covering it, nobody's talking about Fox. You know, everybody's talking about Disney. Well, Disney combined. Did, nobody's even mentioning Fox. And they they do pretty well on Fox. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how much money Fox is making with the ad sales. Uh, somebody told me that they're ab above breaking even. Uh, I don't, I can't, I, I, I never was able to verify that. I should ask Dave, actually. He would probably under know that a little bit more. But nobody's discussing Fox. Uh, is it is it a lack of confidence in what Fox could do with WWE, or is it that maybe they're not really a contender because they have all their other issues between Fox News and, and Fox Property and selling off to Disney? You know what they they're doing on the corporate side. I mean, I don't think you can ever discount the Murdochs ever in any conversation, especially since Rupert Murdoch and Vince McMahon are kind of cut from the same cloth at the end of the day. But I, I do think Fox, as it stands right now, doesn't have the depth of property space that. A company like Comcast has, yeah. especially where like Fox broadcasts, there's usually a hard cut at 10 p.m. for prime time. And that is another thing, by the way, if NBC Universal and Comcast were to acquire WWE in full, you would have to think the expectation would be that Raw or SmackDown would come to broadcast television on the NBC side. And NBC might not want to go beyond 10 p.m for broadcast as well so there are a lot of different wheels in motion and play here that maybe not everyone's thinking about on the surface yeah very interesting stuff here uh this is this is changing the entire trajectory of the year for this company uh you know 2022 was a very strong optics year for this company people that were very much over wwe uh you know cody went over that was a big hit to AEW. vince mcmahon is leaving Second half of the year, creative was much better. Obviously, they had issues, but a lot of people's f favorites came back. You saw people seeing that maybe the grass is greener on the other side. Uh -uh. It's not. <laughs> I feel bad for the people that came back, thinking things are going to be totally different for them, and they're going to have this ability to, to rise in the company. And, you know, things are going back to how it was. A lot more to talk about here. Wrestling Observer Live Sunday Edition. We'll be right back after this. Wrestling Observer Live Sunday Edition here. Joined by John Alba, good friend of mine. Good friend of mine, John Alba. That's how we're billing you from now on. Not that you do strictly like business it. with Eric Bischoff. Not that you do a podcast with Matt Hardy. That's fantastic. Good friend of mine, John Alba. We are good pals. We are good pals. We have, we have a lot of commonalities. A we, lot of it's things. actually terrifying. It is. It is actually really funny. But you know what? We're a product of the environment. We're both Northeastern guys. You know, this is this is what happens here. So let's let's touch on this really quickly. And I want to talk about Russell Kingdom because I, I really saw one of my one of the best matches I've ever seen in my life. One of them. Not saying the match, but one of them on that show. And I really um, I think this is a this is an opportunity for New Japan to take and run because they're hot right now. After being frozen for almost three years, I think this is a good opportunity. But I want to I want to just touch on these couple other things here about the Vince McMahon stuff. And we'll wrap it up. I know we spent a lot of time here, but this is probably going to be the biggest story uh, in, of the year. I didn't think it would get bigger from Vince leaving, but Vince coming back is the <laughs> is the other side of this. What does this mean for creative? I've seen this discussion over and over again on the internet, and I'm going to say if you think Vince McMahon coming back as executive chairman of the board to his company, where he essentially controls most decision-making, that he's not going to have a hand in, in something with creative, I think you're bonkers. I would say that is an insane thought. This man is going to, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but there will be guidance here on creative. I'm not saying he's going to be sitting there and writing the TV and being hands-on, but if he does not want something on TV, it's not going to happen. Do you agree or disagree, John? So... Should all of the hurdles be cleared? I would agree with that. But there is an element of this that we have to remember, and it's that he still is under SEC investigation. He is. And 
right now he is allowed to return to this executive chair role, but to go beyond that role would require SEC approval at this juncture, as far as I understand it. Now, could that change in the coming weeks or months? Absolutely, it could. Yeah. But I, I, I'm not convinced that that's going to be something that changes immediately. Could it eventually? Yes, I absolutely agree with you on that. Yeah, you also know how you get the SEC off your back? When you go private. Correct. <laughs> that's, 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 that's also an option. But, but I do think it's worth saying this too, Andrew. Like, even if there is a sale, yeah, a sale doesn't happen immediately. A sale, no, no, not at all. Takes months and months and months, if not even longer than that. Especially if Especially it's two publicly the, traded companies. Yeah, yeah if correct. it's Comcast, you know, there has there's regulatory. The FTC is involved. The FCC is involved. There's there's regulatory uh, people that are involved. It's not it's not super easy. Now, do I think a sale won't happen if Comcast wants to buy? No, I, I think it would probably happen. Unless something that we don't know is discovered about this this deal, but let me ask you this: gun to your head, yes. By the end of 2023, has WWE been sold in principle? Even if it's not through, has there been a sale agreed upon? I, you know, I. If it was any other company, if it was any other company, I would never think that this is a bluff. If it was any other company, just because it's wrestling and we're kind of, uh, you know, it's just a wacky company. It's not like any other corporate structure I've ever seen in my life. You know, it, it's even though it's a publicly traded company, the way that this was set up from the beginning was that Vince still controls the entire company. You know, it's not like he, he has the shareholders are, you know, he has major powerful shareholders that control you know, pieces of that company. Like we saw what happened with Twitter. You know, Saudi Arabia had a big piece. That Saudi investment fund has a big piece of Twitter. And they could have, they, they were fighting and they were going to, you know, push if they needed to. And they could have, they could have made it more difficult. Vincent does not have that obstacle. That uh, That's the reality of this. He doesn't really have a large hurdle to not do what he wants. I will make a bold prediction because I made yeah, a bold me. prediction on your show about a year ago and I was right about what it. Was it? About what Austin. was it? What was the prediction? Oh, that he's going to wrestle. Yes, he did. And, that he's going to wrestle and that I thought that there was a chance that he might gear up to wrestle more than one match. And we've been seeing those reports. So I got yeah. another one here. I think that by WrestleMania weekend, and it might even be announced WrestleMania weekend in the most Vince McMahon way possible, a sale will at least be agreed upon. And the condition of said sale to whomever it may be will be that Vince McMahon is the one who's allowed to still drive the ship. That will be a condition of the sale that Vince McMahon is put unilaterally in control. And I know that sounds like doomsday for a lot of people. Uh, but it might is, be. I don't know. It's you know, and the, a lot of people, the talent, you know, what is the talent thinking here? What what happens to uh, the talent? Will people want to leave? Have talent? Uh, I have spoken to talent, yes. I have too. And, and it, it's... It's not great. No, <laughs> but you know it, it. You know what's fascinating? I didn't see... I, nobody was shocked. Like, I, I... One person kind of put it that, like, it was like... It was always dangling there, you know? This, like, Vince could come in and do what he's going to do. But they just, they, they just went with the flow. I, I don't think people are shocked that this is happening. Uh, I think it's more like, come on, you know, I thought we were we were evolving a little bit here. We'll find out. We'll see. But what does this mean for talent, especially talent that wanted to go back? You know, there's a lot of those guys that wanted to go back. We're going to find that out, too. Likelihood of going private. We spoke about that. I it, it's I, I'm with you, John. I, I think this is this. If it's not a ploy to get back into power, uh, you know, it, it, I, I don't know what this this could possibly be. Well, also, you know, why would you want to buy it if you're, you're, you're Comcast? I guess to save some money in the long run. Very interesting stuff here. More developing, obviously, in the next couple of days. We're going to find out more information on this. But I want to go to something a little bit more fun than corporate talk here. I know, guys. It's a big story. I got to talk about it, right? Uh, Wrestle Kingdom 17. I absolutely love the show. Uh, I liked it so much better than the previous couple years, obviously, for many reasons. One, they had a crowd back. They were very active. They were lively as much as they could be. Mercedes Mo Monet, formerly known as Sasha Banks. It's not Monet. It's Monet. Monet. Monet debuted. 
Very interesting stuff. Attacking Kyrie at the end. Setting up a match for, between them at Battle in the Valley, February 18th in San Jose. She hit her new finisher on Kyrie, but you know, she got a lot of crap for that. She they were saying that she she messed it up, she didn't do the finish. Kyrie, I think, took it wrong. I agree. I think Kyrie took it improperly. You know, I you know, what are you gonna do? And everybody's nervous a little bit. It's a big show. The show is also going head to head with Elimination Chamber, which is interesting. And it's going to be streaming on uh, Fight TV for nineteen ninety nine. This show, so it's going to be interesting to see. Carl Anderson lost the never never title to Tomatonga. Some rumors coming out that Tomatonga might be headed to WWE. Hikaleo also another rumor about wanting Hikaleo. I think the Hikaleo thing is going to happen. Talking to a couple people, I think Hikaleo is headed over there. And you know why not? Six foot eight, six foot nine, big guy. How could they not? Yeah, uh, regardless of what all of that were, Vince McMahon's in charge. That's an acquisition yeah. you want. Yeah, of course. Yes. I mean, you don't get you don't get guys like that too often no. that are kind of connected in pro wrestling. You know. Let's talk about the match of the night for me. Uh, listen, Okada and Jay White, fantastic match. I, I, you know, any other card, any other show that did not have Kenny Omega and Will Ospreay on it, it would have been match of the night, a match of the year contender. But Kenny Omega and Will Ospreay, I mean, they tore that building down. Kenny Omega defeated Ospreay to win the IWGP United States title for the second time. This was a classic. What did you think of this, John? How amped up, Andrew, did you get seeing Kenny Omega be, be Japan Kenny Omega again? Just that elite next-tier pro wrestler. Not to say he hasn't been great in AW, because he has been. But we also know he was hurt for a while. And the way he was booked as champion was in a very different way than the cleaner that we saw in New Japan. This was, to borrow a Michael Coleism, this was vintage Kenny Omega in about every way possible. I, I, and, it was fantastic, uh, man. I... You know, you, you kind of forget, you know, he came to the States. He changed his style up. Obviously, he was hurt for the majority of his AEW run. He was very banged up. This is this is a fresh Kenny. This is the best that we've seen him since leaving New Japan. Uh, I kind of wish he came out to his... Uh, I, his entrance was awesome, right? But I really wanted to see Devil Sky, mm -hmm. uh, you know, an entrance with that come out. I, dude, and you know what? Let's, let's give it up for Osprey. He, he is oh. really one of the best in the world. I mean... He is. Remarkable. And I was really happy that they went the storytelling route with this match where it could have just been a bunch of exceptional moves and it, people would have loved it if it was just that. But they really went to tell a story and build some empathy on Will Ospreay, a guy who's kind of hard to build a little bit of empathy on. And it was a very violent match, too. I, I was almost surprised by how violent the match was. And clearly, Andrew, you got to think there's going to be a return at some point later this year, potentially, as far as I see it, maybe Forbidden Door 2. Yeah, I would, I would think that would be it, that, that you would have to do it in the States. You would have to do that think, match in the States. And also, you would have to do... Uh, listen, I, I think at the end of the day, you really want to do Okada and Omega again. Yeah, and you want to do them. You want to do that match. By the way, they teamed up in uh, for, for New Year's Dash, which was very mm -hmm. cool to see. And he did come out the Devil Sky for New Year's Dash. It was like, hey, guy, everybody's messaging me now. He did come out. I'm like, I know, but I want to see it in the big stadium, guys. Omega Okada five in uh, you know a, a bigger building. You know, can you in build? the U.S. specifically? In the U.S. In the specifically, US. is that something you could you could sell? I think I mean, so. It's, it's the biggest match outside of Kenny Omega versus Roman Reigns that you can run in wrestling. My children I are believe screaming. That. I don't know if you heard that. Uh, <laughs> and either a mouse is running across the street or someone, there's a home invasion happening here. I, I don't know what's happening, but they were screaming bloody murder just now. Things have settled. We'll find out after after uh, during the break what's happening. My, and I got soundproof doors in the studio, so who knows what's happening? That's impressive. That's impressive then. Very no, impressive. I, I honestly believe that Omega versus Okada in the U.S. is one of the premier matches left that you can possibly run uh, in the United States. Tony Khan probably recognizes that, but we've seen how vulnerable Kenny Omega is to injury. At some point, you got to run that match before it becomes too late. Yeah, and, and you know... I said this when, when CM Punk came to AEW. I said, you know, I know that he has time on his contract. He has a couple of years, but 
you want to get these matches out because he's a, he's older, you know, he's banged up. Uh, he talks about how everything hurts him after his matches, and he's being sincere. He's not doing it to cut a promo. He's he honest, honestly is in pain. He's a guy that worked the indies and a very different style for years. Get these matches out there. I wanted to see him and Danielson, him and Omega, you know, and I, I think they were working their way to that, but obviously what happened happened. The other big story is CM Punk possibly wants to make things work with them. I would be very surprised. I would be Extremely very surprised, surprised too. But however, if there was ever a huge money opportunity, this would be it. These, of course, and, and I get absolutely. at the end of the day, listen, at the end of the day, and I say this all the time. It is a it is a very strange business, but at the end of the day, money matters and money talks. And if you have an opportunity to create this blockbuster moment that you don't get too often, you get once every five years, once every decade to put together a feud or a program like this based off of reality. If you can make it work, you will make it work. And I don't think anybody in, the, you know, obviously things were said, things happened. It, it's terrible how this went. Nobody wanted it to go this way. But if there was ever an opportunity to make it work, this is it. Wrestling Observer Live, Sunday edition. Taking a quick break, and we'll be right back after this. Wrestling Observer Live, Sunday edition. Final few minutes of the show. Joined by my friend John Alba. John, talk about all the stuff that you've been doing. You're all over the place. Not in a bad way, in a positive way, in a great way. You're, you're doing shows with a bunch of people. You, you uh, it's, it's amazing. And I, you know, you're a couple years younger than me. You're far ahead of where I was in the professional wrestling world at... You know, we're at 30 years old. Talk to us. What have you been up to? I appreciate that, man. And uh, yeah, I've, I've been real busy. Obviously, as I said earlier, Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. We just celebrated our one year anniversary with that show. That drops every Friday, wherever you get your podcast. Uh, Strictly Business with Eric Bischoff, which has been running since April, but we just took it in front of the paywall a few months ago. And it's been really, really fantastic, the response we've gotten to that. A podcast that kind of discusses the business of the wrestling business, which is a little different. Yeah, um, I've been doing some work with Fight, doing some interviews with them. I got an interview with Josh Alexander from Impact dropping tomorrow as we tape this. And uh, I've got my wrestling Patreon, Wrestling According to Alba. I'm going to do an Ask Alba right after I get off air on this where people can ask anything. And then uh, I've also got the Alba Media School, which is one-on-one -on -one consultations, Andrew, for anyone who kind of wants to dip their toes into the media field, whether it's on air, in editorial, whatever it may be, content creation, podcasting. And you can do one-on-one -on -one sessions with me. That's the albamediaschool.com. Listen, you do have an Emmy, okay? That's something I don't have, and I don't think I'll ever have. You have an Emmy which is unbelievable. Thanks, you know, people want me to ask you this before we wrap it up. This has come up throughout the entirety of the show. Can Zarian ask Alba percentage on Mercedes showing up at Dynamite on Wednesday? I would say... You know what? Do the WWE answer. Is it a four today? Is it out. an eight today? <laughs> let it play out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let it play out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd say the I would say it is as of today a six out of ten. A six out of ten. Perfect way to end the show. Guys, I had a blast with you all this week on Wrestling Observer Live. Next week, Dave Meltzer will be joining me. I'll see you next time, guys. Take care. <laughs>